Martin. I'm a uh, professor at Columbia Journalism School, former dean there, and um, I'm here in my guise as the publisher and director of Columbia Global Reports, um, which is the publisher of the book that we're here to talk about, uh, The Problem of 12 by John Coates, who's sitting here. Um, Columbia Global Reports was started with a sort of strong nudge by uh, Lee Bollinger, our ex-president, um, some years ago. And we publish six books a year that are kind of short books on big topics. Um, we try to you know, put big issues on the agenda that aren't there. Um, and we publish across a very wide range of topics. We send reporters all over the world. I think this is our 44th book that we've published so far, and we've got a lot more in the pipeline. After you leave, we're selling John's book on a table right outside, um, so you can buy one or many copies. And also uh, wanna say that we are a nonprofit organization, and so we thank everybody who helps it make it possible for us to publish books. Um, I also want to particularly welcome, there's some people here from the Columbia's 1754 Society for Planned Giving, um, and we got a really good turnout from them, so warm welcome to you guys. Um, this is the Richard Paul Richmond Center for Business Law and Public Policy, uh, which is a joint venture of the law school and the business school at Columbia. It promotes evidence-based public policy and fosters dialogue and debate on emerging policy questions where business and markets intersect with the law. Um, so there's one change, which is our announced moderator, Rana Farahar, could not be here. So I am subbing for her and I will be the moderator. Um, but what we'll do first is I'll briefly introduce our, our panelists and, and then each of them will do a presentation. Um, and then uh, one of our panelists is on Zoom, but you'll, you'll see that. Uh, and then we'll go interactive between me and the panelists, between the panelists themselves and with you. So be thinking of questions you'd like to ask and you'll get a chance to ask them before it's all over. Um, okay, John Coates sitting here is the author of The Problem of 12. He is the John F. Kogan Jr. Professor of Law and Economics and Deputy Dean at Harvard Law School. Michael Ewens, who is on Zoom, there he is, okay, uh, is the David L. and Elise M. Dodd Professor of Finance at Columbia Business School and co-director of the Private Equity Program. Jeffrey Gordon, wave. Um, is the Richard Paul Richmond Professor of Law at Columbia Law School and the co-director of the Richmond Center, as well as the Columbia Center for Law and Economic Studies and the Ira M. Milstein Center for Global Markets and Corporate Ownership. Dorothy Lund um, is a professor of law at Columbia Law School. Her research and teaching focus on, is on corporate law, corporate governance, securities regulation, contracts, and mergers and acquisitions. Thanks all for joining. Um, and John, you go first. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Nicholas, for setting this up and asking me to do this book with you, um, which has been a privilege. I will note that the book started as a longer book on a big topic, but he made me cut it. So um, <laughs> it's short now. Well, it started as an internet post that was much Fair shorter. Enough. Yes. And then we turned. And then it, it got to big, and then it got small again. Okay. In the way of books, um, and those out there are signed, by the way, so they'll be worth a lot more. Uh, uh, it's also a delight to be with uh, Jeff, who deserves all the blame for getting me into teaching because he was a, a encouraging person at a point when I was moving from private practice. I was a lawyer at Wachtell Lipton doing M&A, working on behalf of, among others, private equity firms uh, before going to Harvard. And with Dorothy, whose work I drew on in the book and cite in, in particular in chapters two, where it really has helped um, crystallize my thinking. I don't know, Michael, I don't think, uh, but it'll be interesting to, to talk even to the little tiny picture of him up there. Good to see you. So thank you all for coming out on such a nice night. It would have been, you know, natural to keep strolling, but um, um, the topic I think is a big 
big idea, a big picture, something you should certainly be aware of, depending on where you are in your life. It might matter to you in different ways, but I think it should matter to everybody um, that two asset management industries, index funds and private equity funds, have already accumulated direct control or influence over let's ballpark it 50%, 60% of the US economy. And all right, so that's just sector, maybe who cares, banks lend to everybody. But these asset management companies um, are themselves highly concentrated and getting more so over time. So that it's not just that index funds and private equity funds are increasingly important growing their assets. Both have grown at compound annual growth rates over the past 25 years that vastly exceed the economy year after year after year and vastly exceed the size of business generally and in individual businesses in our country. Now, there are outlier companies like Apple and Google that have grown even faster relative to them, but as a sector, these two financial um, types of intermediaries have grown enormously and both and this is the unifying theme between the two types of funds they both enjoy economies of scale meaning they get better in an economic sense at what they do the bigger they get and so far at least we haven't seen them reaching the peak of their economies of scale to tease that out a bit um, for vanguard the most famous index fund complex they um, and State Street currently are fighting with each other over the lowest fee that you can find in a fund to invest in. Um, and that fee is a lot lower today than it was 10 years ago, and it's still lower than 20 years ago. Why is that? After all, inflation costs, things have actually gone up over those 20 years in many parts of our lives. They've gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. And as they get bigger, they're able to do what they do more cheaply per dollar they're managing. So they're then able to keep lowering the cost to their customers, to the American public. And that in a lot of ways is a good thing. And I, I want to be very clear because sometimes I'm confused on this point. Um, I think index funds are wonderful. I use them. It was Vanguard was the first fund I invested in. I also have a BlackRock fund. I also am about to invest in a State Street fund. So I'm investing in all the big ones. Um, and I would tell my children to do that. It's a good financial product. So I'm not here and do not suggest in the book that we crush this industry. That's not a takeaway. Um, the problem, though, the problem in the title is they're so good at what they do and they enjoy such economies of scale that they've gotten to the point now where the top three index fund families, BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard, throw in Fidelity if you want, because they're mostly indexed now. They own that group of four, 30% of the stock of every listed company in the United States, with some exceptions for like the Walmart, Walton dominated families, a few exceptions, but you just think of a modal company, go down the list, Apple, Conoco, IBM, uh, Goldman, Exxon, which I'll come back to in a second, uh, they already own collectively these four groups, 25 to 30% of the stock. It's also true as you go down. It used to be the case when we first started writing about this, that it was more powerful in the bigger companies because that's where the index uh, indexes tended to focus initially. But now I recently went back and looked at the S&P mid cap and the S&C small cap, and they also own 25 to 30% of every company that I had time to check. Uh, uh, which was, you know, 20 or 30 of them. Um, so, okay, you get it? Now, many investors don't vote. If you own shares directly, uh, you may have been tempted to not open the envelope and not return the, the, the ballot. The result is, since these funds do vote, they actually have not 25 to 30, but actually working, you know, 35 to 40% of actual shares voted in every election of directors of every public company in the United States today. It has gone up every year I've been tracking it. And the economies of scale that I've mentioned, and I think other forces that have led to their role currently are not going away. They're only gonna continue, unless something else changes, to 
increase their prevalence as owners of listed companies. So I was at another event last night and we asked the group in the room, is it gonna stop anytime soon? And it's totally against their interest to say no. So they didn't say no, uh, but they didn't say yes either. Um, they danced around the question and they evaded it. Um, so I, I think even if you got representatives index funds in a back room, they would agree with me. They're gonna keep growing. Um, so you get five to 10 years from now and they're gonna own more than half of all the stock of every listed company in the country, at which point formally and legally they have the ability, maybe not, they're gonna not, not gonna exercise it, but they have the ability to appoint all the directors of all those companies. The directors appoint the CEOs, the CEOs choose the strategies, all right, you get it. They run that part of the economy. Now PE, private equity, does not invest in listed companies typically, they buy whole companies. They take them out of the public markets. They use debt to do that. They ratchet up the financial risk. Uh, they try to, they say, squeeze out inefficiencies, uh, make the firms better and then resell them. That's the standard model in private equity. That industry has also grown dramatically. They now rough, ballpark 15 to 20% of all of corporate equity. If you look at federal flow of funds data and the assets under management, just in buyout funds of the industry. And if you throw in other assets that they control like credit funds, they also do lending, they own uh, real estate, they own housing, they own, go down the list. If you just take their assets under management, 12 trillion. It's, um, they sometimes like to pretend they're modest in size, they're not another growing um, giant body and also exhibiting economies of scale so that the biggest of the private equity complexes have grown faster in the last five years than the rest. Um, and I think actually in the current interest rate environment, which is making life a little tricky for private equity, the big guys are gonna get even bigger relative to the small. And, and, and in fact, there's a recent FT article documenting exit by smaller PE complexes. So you're getting concentration again in the biggest players. Here, there's no question they control, completely control the institutions that they invest in for the time that they own them. And as a public policy matter, pose a even more striking um, problem for the rest of us, which is they make no disclosure. They, at the company level, at the level of the companies they control. So for the nursing homes and the real estate and the largest operator of uh, college housing. I don't know whether Columbia's housing is owned by this particular owner, but most college housing now in the country is owned by PE. Uh, pet uh, uh, services, you name the sector, they've started to push into it. They do not tell us much, if anything at all, about what they're doing, what the financial risk they're running with those companies, unless and until they go bankrupt, which they unfortunately do with more frequency than other types of ownership structures. All right, so that's the basic sketch. The problem I think is sort of straightforward. Um, economies of scale and finance are producing a new challenge to American democracy and American capitalism because a very small number of people with that much control over that much of the economy is not something I think is a political equilibrium. We've seen it before. I wanna give full credit to former Columbia law professor, Mark Rowe, who um, I'm riffing on here, his earlier book um, uh, covered the banking uh, sector in the 19th century and the insurance sector in the early 20th century, they went through much the same path. They concentrated finance, acquired outsized control over the economy, generated a political backlash. And today the banking sector is forbidden, Citibank, whatever you think of them, Goldman, whatever you think of them, however much we can blame them for the 2008 crisis, they can't buy non-financial companies by law and haven't been able to since basically the beginning of the Republic. Insurance companies also are strictly limited in how much stock they can control of non-insurance companies um, by law because of the threat they pose. So I think we're now going, we're, we've already started and we're gonna keep going through a similar period of political reaction to this concentration. And so I'll end by saying, uh, the problem of identify, I wish I had a solution. I would have had a different title and we would have thought about it, but I, I the problem the solution of 12. I'm, bring, I'm bringing you a solution problem to which I don't have a great solution. I have mitigants. I have a, ways to manage and first steps. Um, but the problem is two-sided. It's that these institutions themselves represent a threat of a certain kind to the way we run our country. 
And at the same time, elected officials have been known occasionally to overreact or to get carried away with pet ideas. Two quick ones here, one live and real and one historical. So the live and real one was last summer, 20 Republican senators, members, you know, senior members thought to be relatively statesmanlike members of a party known for embracing um, market forces proposed to take away all the votes as a practical matter from the index funds. They didn't quite write it that way, but that's the bottom line of the proposal, which is, would be a dramatically uh, strong intervention into private ordering that I think was a bad idea. And I said so in, in the Senate last summer, and I can talk about why if you're interested. But So that's a live version of one threat to these industries, which I think would be bad. I think it would be bad to crush index funds in that way or to even dramatically inhibit them in their operation. The historical one I'll end on is because of our fear of banks for a long time, 50 to 100 years, we limited banks to a town. They could raise deposits from a town and they could make loans in a town. Now, that's, I don't think by anybody's real honest evaluation, a good place to be. And we, we didn't end there, but it took another 100 years to relax that set of rules. Maybe we went too far in how we deregulated banking, but in any event, that's another example of the second kind of problem I'm raising. So both the threat to our democracy of concentrated economic power without disclosure in the case of PE, and the threat to, particularly I care about index funds, I'm a little less sure about PE, um, because they don't tell us anything. So I'm not really sure whether it'd be good or bad to destroy them. But for index funds, I'm quite confident it would be bad to destroy them. But I do worry that some of the political responses will do just that. And I will stop. Thank you. I should add, um, I used to live in Texas many years ago. When I moved there, it wasn't just one town. A bank could only operate in one building. They couldn't have a, they couldn't have a branch across in town. the town. Yes. And they had to get a special exemption to have an ATM machine that sat outside the building there was such a suspicion of banks. Anyway, that's another story. Uh, Dorothy, since your slides are up there and everyone is just dying of curiosity of what the slides will say sure. after this, I'd like to go to you next. Okay, thank you so much. It's it's a real pleasure to be here discussing this book. Um, it contains so many insights. And I wanna just share some thoughts on the chapters on index funds, like John has mentioned, I've written a bit in this area. Um, and I'm hopefully going to I'm going to ask two questions, and I think the answers of, to these questions will somewhat complicate this picture of index fund domination, maybe reassure everybody in the room that uh, we may not get the worst version of John's story materializing anytime soon. So uh, the first question is, do we really think that the big three or four, um, if you want to lump fidelity in there, uh, are likely to exert effective control over the market anytime soon? Uh, and second, do we think this picture of unfettered control by a few individuals at each asset manager is a realistic one? So on this first question, uh, I'm gonna show you some figures from a working paper with Alain Brav and Lin Zhao at Duke. And we collect evidence about institutional ownership over time from 13F filings. I think we've assembled the most comprehensive uh, collection of, of data on, on institutional ownership over the last two decades. And uh, this first uh, table up here shows you the uh, average number of institutional holders. Um, at, and it shows you that for a firm, and it's increased over time. So this is at the fund family level. So we've gone in the early part of this sample to about 84 institutional shareholders on average for any given company. Um, that's back at, in the 2000s. And today it's high as high as um, 220. So this is just one data point. I don't want to make too much of this, but this was somewhat reassuring for me because I, you know, I, like John, I was worried about this trend, the big three, are they taking over everything? And actually this suggests the big three aren't the only game in town. We have a robust market that's supporting competitors here that could potentially chip away at their dominance over time. So for one additional uh, data point, I think that will also be reassuring. Here's it an ownership table showing the evolution of ownership of the 10 largest, sorry, the mic is kind of going in and out, um, the 10 largest asset managers um, over the past few decades. And it shows you, sorry, it, it, 
I'm, is it, does the sound come out okay? Okay, yep. good. Uh, you can see if you, it's pretty small, but um, if you look at the big three or the first three in this table, the ownership has been going up, but it's going up pretty slowly. And for State Street, it's completely leveled out. State Street is not growing in ownership at all, and it hasn't been for the past decade. Um, it, BlackRock had the biggest jump in ownership in 2009, and that's when it acquired BGI, uh, which was a transformative acquisition that I think nobody thinks is, is on the horizon for that asset manager again. And since then, growth has been ticking upward, but not too quickly. So uh, if we look down the list, we see Morgan Stanley, Geo, JP Morgan, they're all growing too. Um, and so again, I, I found this picture sort of reassuring. You know, this this suggests that maybe we're actually closer to that equilibrium stage uh, where we're going to see this competitive fringe picking up and um, growing and kind of, uh, uh, and we're not going to see this problem of 12 scenario. Maybe it's going to be more like a problem of 45 or something, which may not be as problematic. Okay, so the point remains that, you know, maybe maybe not everyone is that reassured by this picture because it shows you that the big three already have about 20% of the equity market. So with that in mind, I wanted to take a look at, uh, or turn to my second question, which is to really think about what are the big three's, three's incentives? Uh, what are their stewardship practices? Do we think it's realistic that we could have, you know, Larry Fink and his two buddies calling the shots um, over, over corporate America? So to start, I want to just, you know, begin with the simple reminder that the big three are actually each different institutions with completely different ownership and um, governance. And, you know, this slide tells us a little bit about the big differences between each of them in their ownership. And scholars of co corporate governance like to remind us all the time that ownership really matters for incentives. Um, they also differ quite a bit in their composition of assets. So uh, each of these institutions actually manages a whole lot of money in actively managed mutual funds, which John mentions in the book. So they're not just index fund advisors. I think that's really important. Most of the assets managed by Fidelity and, Mut and Vanguard are in mutual funds. They represent less than a third of the assets managed by State Street and less than 60% of the assets managed by BlackRock, as you'll see in these, this table here. So what does that mean? Most retail investors, people like you and me who go out and buy um, uh, you know, shares of companies, we tend to do this through mutual funds. All of this non-mutual fund equity AUM is in other types of structures like separately managed accounts uh, and that, that pension funds, corporations, governments are all investing in. So this matters a whole lot for voting. So each of the big three, yes, they centralize their engagement and their voting and their stewardship practices in a single group, but they all allow active fund portfolio managers to depart from the house view and conduct their own custom engagements. Um, so we actually see some internal differences in voting by each institution. And maybe more importantly, the large institutional clients of the big three that again, represent a huge percentage of AUM for BlackRock and State Street, they often demand that votes are passed through to them. And these pass-through voting programs are expanding rapidly, even to um, retail investors. So this all means that even if we were to say, okay, you know, Abigail Johnson, the CEO of Fidelity, she controls everything that the stewardship group does. The active fund managers are, are going to be able to depart from what she's doing, as well the investors who choose to have their votes passed through. Okay, so even in a world in which each of the big three controlled every vote in their umbrella, I think there's also some important market mechanisms that, again, would limit and maybe the worst version of the, this story, you know, the 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 really really bad um, uh, pictures that we see in our head when we when we get when we hear about this this uh, rising ownership. So, I want to be more concrete about this. These market mechanisms that may provide some accountability. So I'm gonna to return uh, to, or I'm gonna take take a, a closer look at BlackRock. So BlackRock is a public company. Uh, the people in charge are gonna be duty bound to increase profit and maximize shareholder value. The easiest way to do this is to increase AUM. The easiest way to do that is to keep your clients really happy and draw new people in the building. So who are the clients? This shows you that it's corporations, it's public pensions, it's governments, it's individual investors. 
So cozying up to all those groups or providing policies that are not alienating to them is going to be how you make more money. You also want to avoid government black backlash. And so, you know, taking recent events, um, uh, you know, the, the recent red state pushback on ESG was very much damaged profits for BlackRock. That also serves as a constraint. So I think taking this all together, this means that Larry Fink is not going to be out there pursuing a completely idiosyncratic agenda that clients don't support or that would generate public or government disapproval that would generate the institution's profits. That would affect management compensation. It would affect their future employment. And so, uh, you know, again, all this is to say there these, yes, these asset managers are certainly very large. They're certainly very influential, but I think they're subject to some important checks. There's some influence from inside and outside of the institution um, that really check the most frightening versions of the scenario. Uh, so I was going to say a bit about the private equity um, proposals, but John, you didn't really touch on them. Um, so I may just conclude and wrap up with um, just a comment about, you know, the political risk, which I think are really interesting. You know, again, if we, if we think that these, we now have these large, powerful asset managers that are, are um, playing a role in the world, what political risk does this create? And, you know, I think John is absolutely right that what they're doing has become a substitute for ordinary political governance as people have become fed up and, and frustrated with uh, our political system. They're looking for who's powerful, who can act out in the world. Um, they're looking to BlackRock. They're looking to Vanguard. They're looking to State Street. Uh, and and I've, I've written elsewhere that the, what now, you know, these asset managers have responded by almost taking on a regulatory role themselves. They're adopting rules like, you know, I, we need to have at least two female directors on the board. Um, and, and this is a new sort of private regulatory dynamic. And I think this, you know, I share with, with many of John's concerns here about what this private re regulatory dynamic means. Um, in particular, what this means, the political risk, if you have large private actors taking on, you know, issues like climate change, uh, could this frustrate the government's ability to do it um, and, and will they be doing it the right way? Um, so I think these are all really important things to think about, but I also think there's some good stuff going on here too. And when I started looking at this, I was, I was so surprised because climate law experts all were saying, what Larry Fink, what BlackRock is doing is so great, it's so important. And they weren't coming from a place of, you know, we love having wealthy individuals create rules for, for companies. They're coming from a place of just profound frustration uh, with the government and its ability to tackle really, really pressing issues. Um, so, you know, if we're in a really dysfunctional world, um, it, you know, is it great? Is does is this is this a place where we should look for uh, real change? And 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 should we sort of think about how to make that better and, and happen more um, carefully. So just, just some questions to put out there for, for the group. But uh, as we continue wading through this all, I think one thing for sure is that John deserves pretty, plenty of credit for uh, illuminating all these issues. Thank you. Great. And I guess I'll go next to Michael Ewens, which means that the he'll become very big and the slides will become uh, disappeared or smaller. Right? <laughs> can, you, can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay. okay now you're, great. You're much bigger. Wonderful. Okay. So uh, thanks for having me. I apologize for uh, not being in person. I don't want to uh, bring a super spreader event. Um, so um, I, again, uh, thank you for this. This is this is a great um, book to read. I think uh, when you're invited to do the kind of things, first question you should always ask is why me. Um, other than I'm I work down the street and I have a similar affiliation to the uh, institute running this. Um, I, I assume part of this is my job is to be the PE advocate, the blue suit guy, um, or in the words of the book, in the book, uh, the academic cheerleader of the industry. Um, I don't think I'll do that here in my, my limited amount of time, but um, I will have some positive things to say about the private equity side. Um, in my own research, I've sort of focused on the downside risks of this industry and where frictions can have social costs for everyone involved. Um, overall, this book is is impressive. It's a compelling history of these two important financial intermediated areas, private equity and index fund. I learned a ton about index funds. I didn't know much before. And I have a much better understanding of the regulatory side, in particular, of PE. I was worried when it was only 150 pages that uh, 
uh, it would be really difficult to address this question in depth, but uh, John somehow found a way to summarize these complex industries and this problem. Um, I have some quibbles with the, the, the conclusion, but overall I am convinced that the situations these two intermediaries play as dominant players, both economically and politically, is something that demands um, attention. I think John did a great job of summarizing the problem. Um, I, you know, my quick summary is concentrated economic power combined with a world where essentially money can enter politics can lead to some bad outcomes. We've seen this in our own history several times. And I think it's a compelling case that this is something we should look um, closely at. I think what's unique here and important, I'm somewhat biased by my own research, is the role that financial intermediaries are playing here. These two players, index funds and PE funds, invest roughly every, someone else's money. And they are highly incentivized uh, through a, combina a complex equity and uh, fee contracts to generate value for their shareholders. They also have some legal duties. So on the surface, you might think, if you wanted to be sort of pure markets person, is that nothing should be wrong here. These folks are always going to take actions that benefit their shareholders. Of course, we know in many settings this doesn't hold. And my view of this, this uh, book and its conclusion is, is it partially should really emphasize this problem. That is, for this to be a fundamental issue, that is, big index funds, big PE are controlling large parts of the economy. That in and of itself, in my view, is not a problem. The problem is, is that they have incentives above and beyond maximizing the value of their index funds or maximizing the value of their portfolios as a PE. And those, uh, the wedge between the two comes from, from an index fund, comes from the, the, the incentives they have to just get big. So they might, for example, push certain political agendas on management teams because this is good for their marketing to get inflows and thus make more money, not necessarily value creating. For PE, there's lots of research that suggests they are thinking about raising their next fund, some equivalent of tenure in that industry. If I can raise enough funds, I have a certain job for a while. And that leads them to do things that have private benefits, but social costs or costs to their investors. And that to me is the key feature here for when we evaluate these problems. We can agree there's strong power here and we have to incorporate this friction to sort of start worrying about it. Um, I think, you know, in terms of my overview of, of uh, an, or an assessment, I think this intermediated capital channel is really important to understand the costs and benefits. And I think anyone who wants to propose a policy needs to be very careful to think about these managerial incentives. And uh, we, just, we just saw some great discussion on that already. Um, I think the next steps that were proposed, there are lots of uh, options. Uh, they are difficult to implement, but one that came out for me, and I'd love to talk a little bit more about later, was this idea of size disclosures. So right now you disclose lots about financials when you are public. What you could imagine is a world much like Europe where you disclose regardless of your status of public versus private, but perhaps because of size. And this could solve many of the problems on the, at least the, the private equity side. Uh, in my limited amount of time, I just want to highlight a couple of uh, comments that I think might help uh, evaluate what we what we think about the conclusions. So one is tied to the what do we do next? As John highlighted, this is really tough. There is uh, no simple solution. Uh, there's a couple of things I, I saw as I as I worked through this in my head. One is the political power clearly matters here, but it's it's important to note that private equity, if you look in the short five to 10 year window has not done a great job of winning political battles. Um, it's not obvious to me that this large industry is that good at politics. Uh, for example, they got excluded from the PPP loans where they none of their portfolio companies roughly could have advan take advantage of them. Antitrust has not been their friend in terms of uh, these suggested policy changes. The form PF after Dodd-Frank has dramatically changed the disclosure with the government, not shareholders. And then finally, the recent private fund rulings at the SEC TBD. It's not obvious to me that that's uh, a winning game and maybe private equity has economic power, but not political. Another important part of evaluating whether private equity is power is bad for society is evaluating whether it actually helps the economy. The idea that when private equity buys a firm, is it adding value to that firm and thus society? And the book goes through lots of uh, academic evidence on this front. And my view of that evidence is it's nuanced, but generally positive. And we could spend all day discussing that. Uh, but generally, PE does not destroy value on average. When they take over a company on average, of course, they, they add some value. And there's an important point in the book 
that the kind of PE that might be the best at the traditional model are those smaller middle market funds and investing in middle market private family run firms. And the argument in the book is that the KKRs of the world, not to pick on them, are essentially holding most of the capital and doing most of the deals. It's actually not true in the data. Over half of all private equity backed deals the last 10 years have been middle market deals. So it's not the case that KKR is running the industry on a deal level basis. And so in a world where middle market is where we think PE does add value, we might be reassured uh, by, these, by these points. I wouldn't be doing my job here in the limited amount of time if I wouldn't talk about the returns to private equity. It is certainly true in the, that is discussed in the book that private equity does not always beat the market as an asset class. I think it's fair to say that that is not good news for someone who wants to put money in this and at least generate what they call alpha. Um, my view of this, however, is, is, is first that those numbers and all the research are net of fees and carry. So what this is saying is the, the investors in private equity are not making money, but the asset class is actually adding value. It's literally buying low and selling high and presumably doing that because someone's willing to purchase it at that higher price. And I think we have to incorporate that when making some assessment about whether money is being lost here from a societal uh, perspective. Um, the, the other minor point that is tied to this economies of scale piece, which I think is quite an important uh, piece of the book, is that private equity does not have the scale economies, at least in my view, that index funds do. So as an example, KKR is indeed one of, if not the largest private equity investor. The problem they have is they get bigger is they face a real problem in investments availability. So if I'm a $5 billion fund, I can roughly do 10 to 15 deals. I have to write checks of three, $400 million. There are only so many companies out there that I can buy. And if there are four mega funds, they're competing over this. These funds are not getting the economies of scale, at least on the price side uh, that we might expect. And given the fact I described earlier about middle market, it's not obvious to me that the e economies of scale story that we have an index fund applies as well to PE. Um, I have some other minor comments. I posed some questions to the panel moderator. I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. Those are my high level views. Overall, this is a, I really encourage anyone who's interested in this topic to read the book. It's uh, a compelling argument and one that I think is gonna keep the conversation going in positive ways. Okay, thank you. And Jeff, uh, I'll go to you next. Does this work? I hope it works. This is one way to find out. Hello? Yeah, is this working? Go. It's working. Oh, okay, great. So um, pleasure uh, to be here. And uh, I'm so impressed by um, the discussions from each of the three who uh, preceded me. Um, I've known John a long time. Um, he's uh, an extremely uh, important person in our field. And, and um, he, he, coined, he, he coined a pivotal idea in uh, the world of uh, m a and m a defense, which is the shadow pill. So the idea that every firm has a pill, uh, whether or not they've adopted a poison pill, just because it's so easy to put in place. And therefore, in understanding how the m a mar market works, we have to understand the easy availability for every firm for a shadow pill. That's John. Um, and and uh, a lot of the finance guys have yet to get this idea, but um, you know it's a pivotal idea in the legal uh, the law world. Um, and and there are many other ideas that I associate with John, including the recent way in which he's reminded us that um, SPACs are not consistent with the federal securities, or the DSPAC <laughs> is not consistent with. I'm being uh, censored, I guess. Um, anyway, so um, 12 is. I think you have to keep it near you. Yeah. It, um, it's, it's, a, it's a um, proximity thing. Yeah. So 12 is quite an important image for a concentration of financial power that has been historically anathema to the American spirit. Um, and as John suggests, sometimes an overconcern with the potential for financial power has been to our great disadvantage. The concern about the potential power of banks led to a fragmented system of unit banks that created an unstable uh, financial system that eventually produced the Great Depression. And in the aftermath 
produced a financial system that did credit intermediation through securities markets rather than these small banks. And this in turn actually was uh, the reason we had the global financial crisis of 2008 because of a flaw in the way that unit banking distorted the financial system in the United States going forward. On the other hand, the focus on the money trust of the 1910s, the Peugeot Committee, which showed that director interlocks among the large firms that were then coming into being over a national economy, um, this led to the passage of the Clayton Antitrust Act and the Federal Trade Commission Act, uh, uh, deriving directly from concerns about the concentration of economic power that were then, then emerging. Um, so, so John is quite sensitive to some of the advantages of the arrangements that he identifies as making up the problem of 12 particularly when it comes to the provision of cost-effective, economically sensible savings slash investment vehicles for millions of American retail investors. The PE firms fall into a different bucket of concern for him, and I think he's right about that. So like him, I want to distinguish between the Black Rocks, the Vanguard, State Street Fidelity, on the one hand versus the PE giants, the, the KKR, the Blackstone, the Bain, and the, T, the TPG. I think the, the mega hedge funds like the Citadels and Millenniums are part of a problem of 12, but their own category. So as a, a, a critical Piece. John discusses uh, 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 political money as part of part of his story, and I'm, I'm not sure that political speech is part of the issue of twelve. Um, in that, many firms of different sizes uh, spend money on political speech. Lobbying, on the one hand, is one person's way of revealing information to uh, the lawmakers. After all. And finally, the big political dollars come from the mega donors, the individuals who um, come from all over the economy and, and whose you know, present influence on our uh, political life is obviously very important. So turning to the 12, my general view is that the issue presented by the asset management firm vanguards, et cetera, are on the one hand relatively unimportant, but in another sense profound and beyond solution. But on the other hand, the issue presented by the PE firms is profound, but we could solve it if we had the political will. So why is the issue about the asset and managers relatively unimportant? Well, first, in themselves, they don't crave political power. It's not their <clears> business <throat> model. They've been pushed into stewardship and ESG uh, as a mar marketing uh, uh, duty. Not in a trivial sense, but in the belief that there's demand for some ESG attention, whatever ESG is, is among investors and satisfying investors' demand is their business. They will engage in politics to protect the business movement, but not to pursue substantive me measures just because they might improve risk-adjusted returns. If it generates political pushback that threatens the business model. So this is a kind of agency clause, and we live with it, and, and it limits the ambition that, that they have. Um, indeed, as we see currently, the asset man managers are trying to divest themselves of this power through pass-through voting. Uh, they want to pass the political hot potato of decision-making on these issues to, to the investors to the extent that they can. So, and if we think that BlackRock has too much share 
holder of voting power, it would not be hard to impose an asset cap. We could produce several substantial asset managers without producing that much, I think, by scale economies. Uh, to some extent, the scale, the, the reason the fees are so low now is because the, these firms in, engage in lending stock and earn fees, and they use that to drive down costs. And that would be true if there were more of them rather than fewer. Um, the real challenge, and why I think this is such a hard issue to solve, is because of modern portfolio theory itself, which provides the basis for the index fund and imposes a certain behavioral structure that would apply to all asset ma managers selling uh, a similar low cost, high diversif uh, diversified port, 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 port portfolio. The point is this, investors and are, are looking to achieve diversification at the portfolio level, not the firm level, meaning that investors can eliminate uh, idiosyncratic risk through a diversified portfolio um, uh, rather than holding shares uh, themselves in firms of diverse business interests. The implications are these. The investors, because they're holding shares in this portfolio, are risk neutral when it comes to the failure of any particular firm in the portfolio. Um, and so this means that investors want their, uh, the, the managements of these firms to pursue uh, decisions which have the highest expected returns um, with the implication that uh, employees may bear risk because of the way these fir firms are run, um, driven by the modern portfolio vision. Index funds are very much part of this structure. Um, uh, the lo logic of modern portfolio theory means that the index funds, if there are three of them or 12, will see the world in the same way. And will want the management teams of these firms to, to pursue a strategy that assumes that, again, the shareholders are neutral as to risk taken on by, by these firms and their aggressive efforts to achieve highest expected returns, irrespective of the potential social costs of, of the, uh, potential, uh, the potential disruption borne by employees from conducting business in this way. All right, so again, this is a very deep issue, and I don't think it's a, it matters whether you have three or 12 or 20, because they see the world in the same way, and they will want firms to be governed in the same way. PE firms, this is a real threat. This is the Peugeot Commission. This is economic power um, that comes with the operational control over large chunks of the American economy, and because of the, fr frankly, the fact that there's very little disclosure about how that power is being 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 used. Um, now, in in M and A, you know, I discuss PE as a governance strategy, and I'm generally endorsing of it. Um, and the whole issue is whether it's a transitional form or a better way to run firms over the long term. The issue I get from students is conglomeration. Why isn't this just a repeat of the failed experiment of the 50s and the 60s? The answer is because of forced exit. The PE strat strategy is that they uh, they buy a firm, they, they hold it for five, six, seven years, and then they're forced to exit, which is a settling up of whether they've done a good job. And it limits the amount of economic scope that they'll have because they have to sell off these firms. Well, what we now see is that the PE firms are now selling firms among themselves. You don't have to be too suspicious to sort of think, um, one firm might think, you know, I'll sell you uh, my dog and you'll mar mark it up by 20%, so I've got great returns from my investors. In return, I'll return the favor, right? So there's a cycling here, which is, is of great risk, pre precisely because it threatens the economic efficiency defense of the PE model. Um, uh, and, and you see this in the effort of these, of these 
uh, funds to can have a, a new fund so they can hold hold on to the firms forever. So so I think that's a real, I mean, a real concern about the efficiency of the model and the elimination of check of their growing ec ec economic clout. Now, the solution here is relatively easy. We basically say you have to sell it off. There has to be a, 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 a settling up. You, you have to divest after X per period of time as your original deal with your investors was. But although there's a solution, I think it's politically difficult. Um, you know, unlike my, Michael, I think the PE firms have got considerable political clout. I mean, their ability to, to hold on to the carried interest uh, in the face of you know, it makes no sense um, uh, in term, terms of the tax tax analogies. That's political power. Um, so anyway, um, I think John has identified a real issue here um, of 12. Uh, but, you know, as, as the discussions here presented, there are many moving pieces and, and figuring out what to do about it is really very hard. But... John started us. Okay, so thanks everybody. Um, be thinking about questions, but before I'll ask a couple questions. Um, but first, John, do you want to respond? I saw you taking lots of notes. I have lots of notes, but um, I, I, very briefly, because I do want to have a discussion. Um, so just, just so I'm sure many of you noticed, there's some tension between the three commentators. So, I mean, Jeff thinks he's bad, Michael thinks they're better than that. Um, uh, Jeff thinks that all index funds all want to vote the same way or run firms the same way. Dorothy says they actually divide, so we don't have to worry about them as much. I just note that there's some interesting, difficult um, contests already emerged from the book, so I like my book already. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it also makes me think all kinds of things. I could go on and on. Um, but I, I like one quick story, just for those of you who haven't followed it, and then a follow-up on index funds. And I'll say one brief word about PE. But, you know, the Exxon fight, this is like the poster child for the index funds. Um, you know, a tiny hedge fund that would traditionally have had no chance of success nominated four directors to the Exxon board and got three of them elected, almost certainly to the shock of the Exxon board. Um, and I say that because I, I know, but also because it's just not an equilibrium outcome for a public company board of Exxon stature to lose a proxy battle of that kind. If they had really expected that outcome, they would have figured out some way to figure out how to buy off engine number one earlier. They tried to, in fact, to stock their board with some alternates. So that was a shock. Now, some people, will, and, it, and just to tie it off, it happened because of the index funds. It happened because BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street all voted for two of the three slightly different, so true, Dorothy, they didn't vote identically, but collectively they determined the outcome of that vote. And that is illustrative of the contingent power that the index funds have. If somebody else starts a battle, it only takes a small number of conversations between the different com opponents in that battle with the index fund uh, governance staff and you can either win or lose just with that small number of conversations, okay? Now, it is true that since then, the index funds have gotten some backlash, and so they've changed. So if you kind of like the idea that Exxon was pushed to be more sustainable by the index funds, which for a little while that seemed like, you know, what they were doing, well, now they're kind of going the other way. And in fact, Vanguard in particular, voted no on all the environmental proposals this past proxy season. And BlackRock has chastened and is and Larry Fink in his letter this year was much shorter and contained no reference to climate um, you know, of a meaningful sort. Um, so that ought to bother you if you like what they were doing. Uh, and, and the point is either way, they matter to the outcome. So one quick anecdote on that, Starbucks had a shareholder proposal this spring after the index funds have gone through their Exxon chastening and they split. Um, the shareholder vote was about labor policy. Was Starbucks doing right or wrong by their employees? Should they have an independent evaluation of whether they were complying with their legal obligations under labor law? 
obviously politically salient in the front pages every day. It's a part of the overall labor movement right now. This is something that many people care about. Um, the index funds determine the outcome of that vote. BlackRock and Vanguard voted against. They voted with Starbucks management team. State Street voted in favor and pushed it over the edge. If it had not been for State Street, it would have not passed. So I'm not here to tell you there are three people in a dark room all agreeing on identical things. Sorry, Jeff, they actually don't agree on their goals and they matter to corporate behavior. So I'm with Dorothy to say it's not quite as dark as it might seem. But don't kid yourself, this is where a lot of the action is on important corporate moments, partly for the reason Dorothy alluded, which is, of course, Washington is largely broken. Um, and certainly anybody under a certain age has no faith that the political system, the ordinary political system will produce results. Now, on PE, I think I'm with Jeff, Michael, on political power, not only carried interest, but just the basic structure of debt leverage, financial risk, that they ratchet up through a buyout being tax favored is something they will fight to the death to defend. And it's highly debatable point as a matter of financial fiscal policy, whether it makes sense. Um, more generally, private equity, you know, in the carried interest fight swung Schumer. So I blame all you. Um, you can vote him out or you can call him up, or you can pressure him, but it's interesting, right? He's a Democrat, he's a leader of the Democratic Party carrying the water for the PE funds. And at the same time, I go to Houston, I give this talk, I talk about the nursing homes that PE funds have taken over, where their health outcomes are really not very good, and where they've not done a financially terribly good job either based on the public reports. And this is where I want to leave you on PE. I think it's, it's both as bad as Jeff says, and also worth in some sectors. I think PE is great, if you think the business they're taking over is well-regulated by law and regulation, if you can trust the legal system completely to give the PE fund the right incentive to run the business in a socially responsible way, they will run it beautifully. They will make the most amount of money, they'll do it efficiently, and they'll respect the law, and so it'll all be great. Um, so when they make widgets, I'm all fair, um, you know, fine, take over the widget companies. But when we rely on professionals like nurses and doctors and people who have been socialized into not overreaching with their customers and not taking advantage of short-term gains to long-term benefit, long-term detriment, excuse me, um, I think, the, and we don't have an effective regulatory system in its place, we rely on norms and, right, I think the P model is terrible there. I think the incentives that are great in this other context become disastrous. And right now, they don't have to report anything about all of that other than in at bankruptcy, right? Um, or under subpoena from Congress. And so like, that's, I think the place where if I were in the PE business, I would be worried. I would be worried that the, you know, the other PE business firms, because mine would be good. The other ones will start generating that kind of social harm and that will pr produce political backlash. All right, I'm done. Okay. okay. Um, I'm gonna ask a couple of sort of larger framing questions. Again, um, I'm urging audience members to be thinking of your own questions and, and we'll give you plenty of chance to ask them. So uh, first, um, you know, there's a wonderful essay that the Columbia historian Richard Hofstadter wrote in 1964 called Whatever Happened to the Antitrust Movement. And he basically says in this, in this essay, uh, the main event in American politics for 50 years, which he lists as 1890 to 1940 was, I guess, what we could call political economy. And th those were the most salient issues with voters. But he said, now those issues have been solved. And so it's not on people's radar screens anymore. It's, it's now for the experts only. Um, question is, you know, and you all are experts on this topic and maybe not political savants, but so maybe it's hard to answer. John's book is based on the idea that it happened before, so it'll eventually happen again, this question of concentration of financial power being a political issue with consequences. Um, do you see any evidence that that's happening as of now? Trump. Say more. Yeah, it seems evident that a significant part of Trump's somewhat counterintuitive political support, I worked on his first bankruptcy, 
He came to the close and sexually harassed one of our paralegals, and his only goal was to get personally released from it. I had no, no idea he could win in politics. My whole impression of him from working in Wall Street was he was obviously disqualified. But he saw something and is good at tapping into, on the right, a sense of being politically left behind by our economy. I think that's in part because of concentration of wealth. And P, more than anything else in the book, is partly responsible for some of that inequality. I also think general perceptions on the political threat, that is like, even if you like index funds, which I do, the threat to them is because, frankly, most Americans couldn't tell you the difference between an index fund and a private equity fund. They're just part of that money thing. And I do think that's part of Trump too. So, I mean, like, and I could say some things on the left, but I'll, I'm content. Does anybody else have anything to say about this issue? Do you see any, any politics of this arising? Well, I mean, you, 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 um, it's, it's, it's quite stunning to see, uh, uh, the pushback politically driven pushback to the relatively mild venture into ESG that pension funds and, uh, the asset ma managers have, um, engaged in, um, in Europe, for example, They've gone way down a very different road of disclosure and uh, uh, requirements of of human rights uh, observances by these firms. Uh, very different road. And and in the United States, <laughs> for a pension fund to consider ESG all of a sudden uh, becomes an issue. And so that suggests that there's these firms are already feeling the political heat and are engaging in protective ways to avoid it so so that you know i mean where there i mean is there going to be a tipping point in which the uh um action against them becomes more pointed i i think um nick you couldn't say no on the basis of you know a slight lean on esg produces a pretty significant pushback because the us is a petro state in many respects and the interests that would be energized by these funds doing anything further are powerful indeed. I think I'll just quickly uh, jump in and on the ESG backlash point. I think that, you know, Jeff's exactly right that at, that at the beginning of this, when management for, for a long time, by the way, index funds were, you know, the the rule was we just follow the market and we don't intervene at all. They were basically asleep at the wheel. And then something changed um, maybe a decade ago and they started to intervene more and more. And of course, as soon as this happened, companies sat up and took notice and were really annoyed. I remember I got a call, you know, and I was a, um, a, a you know, a fellow on the, on the teaching market. I wrote a paper advocating that their power should be diffused, which is now what, um, you know, some senators want to do. I got a call from a group that said, oh, we're the Main Street Investors Coalition. Turns out it's the National Association of Manufacturers doing a, a lobbying group. And they said, you know, all of our clients are really annoyed because we keep getting these shareholder proposals on climate and all these things. And, you know, that no, and they're, they're doing better and better and better. And we just want to get rid of these guys. You know, they, they, they're, they're really a thorn in our side. And so we want you to, you know, bring it, you know, advertise your proposal and promote it and all this stuff. Um, and I was flattered, but declined. Um, so I think it may, this, you know, this was the beginning. And then when they got caught, you know, in the crosshairs of the culture wars um, with, you know, Ron DeSantis going anti-woke and everybody deciding now BlackRock, Vanguard and State Street are, you know, at the for foreground of woke capitalism and directing state pension funds to, um, or, you know, state treasurers to note to boycott BlackRock um, or any, any asset managers that says they're going to divest from fa fossil fuels. I mean, there's, it, it, maybe a dozen states have done this. Um, so this is, this is again, and, and, you know, it's, it's getting closer and closer, really jeopardizing, of course, hitting their bottom line, uh, resulting in a, a, some backpedaling, um, and could be an existential threat to the industry. I think John rightly points out because this is, this is history. This is just what's happened. Anytime you see a giant accumulation of power, um, in, in, in capital markets, 
America doesn't like that. You know, you, you see a clampdown. So I think I think everyone rightly fears in the index fund industry that this is where this is going. And this is exactly what Jeff said. They're they're trying to diffuse the threat and and make it look, you know, pass through the votes and just get rid of this political hot potato. Um okay. So I'm gonna ask another question, um, kind of a big question about ESG. Do you all know what that set of initials stands for? We're just preaching to the choir here, so to speak. Um, so I, I hear some differences among the group, I think. One camp, I, I don't want to say who's in the camp, says the companies don't want to do ESG. They're just doing it because they feel they have to or they're being pushed into it or for political protection or PR type reasons. Another uh, view is these are good causes, you know, uh, climate is a good cause, diversity is a good cause. And, you know, if government's not gonna act forcefully uh, on these causes and these big powerful private companies are willing to step up and do it, why the hell not? Let's let them do it. Um, so I'm asking an empirical question, which is why do they, engage in ESG. And I'm also asking a normative question, which is, you know, in terms of sort of democratic theory, do you want non-democratic private sector giants essentially making public policy if it's good public policy? Michael, you didn't respond on the last round. So why don't, do you want to jump into any of this? Sure. Um, I, I think the ESG and private equity is, is unique in that uh, the nature of the funds is that they're relatively, there's closely held that maybe 10, 40 limited partners. And those players, pension funds, endowments, corporations have uh, a lot of incentive and they're listened to by uh, the general partners. And there's an argument to be made that private equity, if these are true social goals, are more likely to, to take those preferences uh, to their portfolio companies uh, given the repeated game that they play. Uh, so it's not obvious when we look at private equity as just pure profit motive. I indeed would think ESG is not going to work so well uh, for that. Uh, but I would say that given they're privately held and small number of owners on the GP side, the concerns you're talking about are, are, are much less so. I'm not as worried about uh, a private equity manager like KKR deciding to implement diversity in all their portfolio companies. If that is a bad thing, there are quick ways they will get punished in the fundraising process after a few years. And they're generally listening to these large like CalPERS, for example, has really pushed this when they build their own portfolios. Um, whereas I think in the index fund side, it's not obvious to me that the average retail investor has these preferences and is somehow moving money around between BlackRock and State Street, given these preferences. And uh, I, I just it's, it seems like a completely different game. But uh, other than that, I don't I don't have much more on that. Dorothy? Yeah, I'll jump in here. Um, I, I know Jeff and I have sort of different views on this. Um, I, you know, I think I'll start by saying, I think a, a lot of people are looking at these asset managers to tackle issues. And there was a, remember there was a, a wave in, in corporate law scholarship where people would write papers that were like, here's a problem I care about. And here's why institutional investors should solve it. Because, you know, again, they, they own all of corporate America in, in, in some sense, and they could be hugely influential as, as, as John pointed out. So that's not to say that they're jumping in on all of these issues. And it, it's really interesting to analyze the pattern of where they jump in and where they don't. And so I think, you know, they've been really proactive on board diversity. They've been really proactive on certain climate, you know, climate disclosure, net zero um, commitments, things like that. Um, not very active on corporate political spending, not very uh, active on, you know, really any other issue that you, you could think about um, in the in the sort of like ESG space. Um, so, you know, my theory as to why they act when they do um, again, there's a constraint in that they are doing what's profit maximizing for them. And they're doing what, you know, really they're, 
their clients, which are individual investors, which are pension funds, importantly, which are corporations um, that are, you know, funneling 401k accounts to, to these asset managers. And, and then there's a separate constraint, which is you don't want to, you know, alienate the government or your regulators. So it's sort of this complex incentive calculus. And I think if you put each of these initiatives that they've done through that calculus, even climate change, which you might think, why would corporations want to be bound by, you know, climate disclosure. Why would that make any sense? Well, um, regulation serves as a barrier to entry. So if you're a big company, you might say, hey, I have my shareholders coming after me to, to, to disclose. I, I prefer if I'm going to have to do it, I want everybody else to invest in the same cost. And hey, it's going to keep smaller entrants out of the market. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why corporations are into this and not, you know, regulation and, and corporate critical spending or other things that, you know, people care about and think would be a really good idea. Um, so I think that's sort of how I think about why they act when they do. And again, it's it's somewhat reassuring in that it's not as unconstrained. You know, they're not going to go way out on a limb on something that's going to generate a lot of backlash because, you know, as we've seen with the, even this, this sort of tepid climate stuff, it's, it hasn't worked out so well for them. Any other? That's funny. It's okay. Well, one, one word. Let me just sure. make one observation. So, um, so let's just separate. There's the companies and whether they voluntarily engage in ESG or whether we want in some way to push them to do so. And then there's what the funds do on top of that. And they're somewhat distinct because sometimes companies actually are out ahead of what the funds are pushing on a particular ESG category. Just that, you know, just think about this differently. Um, I also wanted to mention the G in ESG. Um, usually environmental and social get the focus, and that's kind of the political valence of most of the discussions. The G in it, which is governance, um, can mean some things in that category like corruption and anti-bribery and tax policy, but it also can mean the kind of stuff that us board and corporate law people spend our time thinking about, like the precise mechanisms of how boards and shareholders relate to each other. And here's something where the index funds are openly still proud to be willing to exert power directly, which is whenever there's a choice between whether the shareholders collectively get power or not, they want it, right? So there is <laughs> there is a way, and it's not clear to me actually that that's better for financial returns, but it is better for their ability to make decisions when they want to, to get information out of boards when they want to, to when they choose to, to intervene. And I, I just, to me, that's a latent and often missed piece of what the index funds are doing that shows actually they are powerful and are perfectly willing to be open about grabbing more power. And when I talk about this topic, to go back to Dorothy's, I have a slightly different way of framing it, um, not the trade group, but just like talking to directors of companies. This is how they perceive it. <laughs> yeah, the Exxon thing, yeah, ESG, yeah, yeah. But really, actually, we just feel a slippage of power to them over time so that we find ourselves having more conversations about how to placate the representative of the index fund than we do to placating the stock analyst who we used to have to spend a lot more time with. Um, so I like to me, I, I know Dorothy wants you to feel it's not so bad. It's not not a big deal really all coming to an equilibrium soon. I don't see it. I think it's going to keep going in that direction. I One last little comment I also want to say, sorry. Um, I, I learned about the country of Oman recently because the U.S. men's soccer team played them and my kids are soccer players. And so I read the history of Oman. It's an interesting history. It's the oldest continuously operating um, uh, Muslim uh, country, independent. But for 150 years, you know who ran it? England. Without any overt power of a formal kind. The, it, like it's uncontested, everybody on all sides of the issue of the history of this country basically all agree that it was run from London. And I mention this because often people will say, I can't see the index funds exerting power. They're not actually nominating directors. They're not taking over businesses. They're not, that's true. Uh, that doesn't mean they don't have an enormous amount of influence over how companies are running. Okay, let me right, so 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 let me just say, I mean, this points out, you know, um, in a sense, all right, so 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 I made a claim that all of these funds would see the world in roughly the same way. And then it was pointed out, well, when it comes to shareholder proposals on ESG, they 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 divide. So what John has pointed out 
when his fo focus on governance is when it comes to the the economic pressures that a management feels from the activists, for example, what they know if they have not delivered on the economic performance side, they face an activist challenge and the index funds will be there if the economic performance has a short shortfall to support the activist in a certain way. Mm -hmm. That's the part of the pressure that I think comes from the na nature of the instrument and would be the same if you were having 10 or three or 20 of these funds. When it comes to, and, and that seems to me is first order because that's how the economy is run. That's how the employees see the world. The, the, the ESG stuff, the shareholder proposals, which may or may not affect behavior, but certainly create you know, um, a certain buzz, and that may affect behavior. It may affect politics. I guess I, I, you can't push push that that aside. But, but in a way, there are almost two different realms. And in the realm that I think is really important, the index funds, as John said, have power, and they see the world in the same way, much like the PE firms see see the world in the same way. Coming back to the Exxon case, the reason that Engine One. One was not because of ESG. It won because Exxon's economic performance was at the bottom of the pile of its competitors that underperformed systematically over many years. So engine one sort of lit the fuse, as it were. But what drove the success was an evaluation how Exxon had done on the economic basis of its performance. And so I, I think we shouldn't over... Terp, 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 interpret that event for these funds' ability to, to have influence on the ESG dimension. Okay, let me harvest some questions from the audience. Who has a question? I see somebody way in the back, sir. Yeah, um, so just uh, one thing on like whether you have any thoughts on the emergence of like private credit, um, private capital going into the credit markets, like taking the role of banks. Um, and also, like the the you know move out of banks and public markets into into private equity broadly, do you think that it's kind of like a like a like it's just hard being a public company? The regulatory burdens are so high, and maybe like it's a it's a sort of regulatory arbitrage, and we just need to make it easier to be a public company or a bank. And those two things. Any thoughts on that? Any? Yeah, I have I have strong views on the second one and weaker views on the first one. Uh, on the second one, the evidence is no that that regulation of public companies is not a significant driver of uh, exit from listed company status. Um, I can all I have to do is point you to two, 2021, which we had the world's largest IPO boom in history. Companies going public. And we did not have deregulation that immediately preceded it. And the regulation was largely the same as it was um, today. And, 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 and so we have these huge cycles in going public that are clearly not driven by regulation. Now, you, you can certainly point to specific rules that a lot of directors will complain about, but I think they're at best very, very um, minor contributors. Well, in the credit, quickly, this is a piece of PE's growth. So private equity is a major part of the growth of um, non-bank credit, and they run large credit funds, and they increasingly, to just tie to a point Jeff made in passing, not only sell companies to themselves, one fund buying from another fund, they fund the buyouts each of those equity funds make with loans from their credit funds. So if you want to count up the number of conflicts of interest embedded in some of these <laughs> transactions, you quickly get past one hand. And this is new. When I was a young tyke coming out of law school, private equity fund was a nice silo. They bought, they ran, they sold. They didn't lend to themselves. They didn't sell to themselves. They didn't manage the, the business over time. And so I like to tie this in. I do think the growth of private credit has been a fuel to the growth of private equity. And it is a part of what I think uh, makes me worried about them to, to, to some extent. Sir. Uh, hi. So um, following up that point, um, you know, if you look at the historical examples uh, that you cite in your book and, um, you know, one of the biggest problems when we have these concentrations of capital is the uh, capture of highly leveraged intermediaries, insurance companies and banks. Right. And 
much of the reaction was to sever those uh, relationships. I just anecdotally will tell you that you know yesterday I was asked by the uh, by a partner in one of the very very large PE firms uh, about some business ideas they had, and the um, you know it was very clear that they were going to use their insurance company uh, and their private credit fund. Uh, to uh, achieve the transaction. So it appears that it, to some degree, the the wall that you suggested existed in the insurance side, I think it's still there in the bank side more or less, but it may be um, faltering a little insurance. And I think back to the uh, junk bond era and executive life and the other uh, ways in which that happened. What's your thought about that? No, it's a great point. And be clear that that wall is still there. It's just that we flipped the structure. So the old days was the insurance company owning companies and controlling them and having conflicts at that level. Now we've got PE funds controlling insurance and other portfolio companies and then creating conflicts at the business level. And I, I just like, I, look, I mean, um, Adam Smith pointed out, you get some people with common interests in a room. And the first thing they do is conspire to fix prices and otherwise engage in what would be today called an antitrust crime. Um, and I I think private equity, it, it would be against human nature for organizations of the size and scale that they're rapidly continuing to become to not start engaging in serious conflicts. And Michael, this would be, I do say this in the book, this is the one like, like, you know, good old fashioned incentive based financial regulatory worry that I would introduce about private equity that right now, our conflict of interest regulation generally is really, really weak, and is not backed up by disclosure. And that's why for me disclosure is an important part of the, uh, the resolution. I think we have time for like one more question, sir, with the mask. Can you pull your mask down just to ask the question? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, two minutes, sir. And in the um, the role of uh, of the uh, large financial institutions, uh, like the financial stock custody, asset management, type fund, uh, which I've not said all that, uh, not only in controlling. Uh, our economy and our politics, but in sort of all of uh, all of global human society with uh, so as one example, uh, also ninety percent of sovereign debt being uh, either uh, the dollar denominated uh, received in place under the bond state of New York or pound denominated received in place under the bond state of money. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to ask you to sort of point toward a question, okay? Fine. John? What's the question? Is it okay? Okay, so we're out of time, so we really need to I'll get you with, to say. I'll do with the part that I gather. I mean, I like there's a point there, which is that the financial. So I, I do think finance lends itself to economies of scale across the board, no matter which piece of finance you're talking about. I just think it conduces to it because it's ephemeral. It's basically always been, you know, basically intangible. It's easy to do in at large levels more cheaply than than um, than other kinds of activities. That then, coupled with the growth of finance in human history, has met repeated cycles of concentration of power. I think this is another example of it. I, you know, I, I don't think it's the end of the world. I think we have learned over time there are ways to combat, control, and limit. Some are better than others. I would like to think the book will get us talking about better ways to address the concentration that's growing here rather than worse ways. Um, so that we got to stop. It's, it's after 8.30. Yeah. So, thank you um, all. All of you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And um you know, don't forget that uh, books are for sale right outside as you leave.